Hello, YouTubers! Welcome to Wherezilla's Retrospective. I'm your host, Where Wherezilla. Wow, I've been saying that a lot for the last seven years, haven't I? Wherezilla's Retrospective has been an interesting experience for me. Sometimes I've made good videos that people seem to enjoy, other times, not so much. But one thing that remains consistent is how we all celebrate the channel's anniversary. Talking about a Japanese Transformer show. The Takara Trilogy, Robots in Disguise, as in the original one, and the Unicron Trilogy. But you may have noticed one, technically two, shows were left out. The Japanese Beast Wars shows. Unfortunately for the latter one, Beast Wars Neo, that still does not have an English subtitled version. But thanks to my fans, I was pointing out to one that does exist for Beast Wars Second. This is a fan sub done by Karudo Fan Subs. I hope I pronounced that right. And they admit that some things the characters say in the show don't translate well into English. This will be important when we talk about the writing of the show. Much like how Robots in Disguise was made to whet audiences' appetite while Hasbro worked on production of the Armada toys and show, Beast Wars 2nd was made up of mostly recolored G1 and G2 toys as well as existing Beast Wars toys to create its own toy line. Say toy line that many times in a row, it's fun. But parallels to other Transformers shows that I've reviewed don't end there. They're all over the place. In fact, it's kind of funny that I'm doing Beast Wars 2nd after both trilogies and Robots in Disguise, since Beast Wars 2nd is kind of an amalgamation of all seven shows, for better and for worst. The flaw is more so, but we'll cover that as we go. Let us begin with the show's theme song and our first parallel. What in the flying hell? Check, check. I, I don't even... That's right. The first parallel between this show and the others I reviewed is with Headmasters. Now, admittedly, this song isn't quite as annoying as Headmasters' theme, but as far as these lyrics are concerned, what am I supposed to fail? What message is trying to be conveyed? If you actually read the whole thing, it translates out to literal nonsense. Can you imagine what this would look like if this song was used in the original Beast Wars? We open with the episode, The New Forces Arrive, and we see a pair of Maximals, Lyo Convoy. Although I should probably clarify, know that despite that name, this is not the original Optimus Prime. Beast Wars had a habit of giving G1 names to their new characters. After all, you can't get much more different between Inferno and Inferno. And Apache, the former getting separated in an asteroid field, crash landing on the planet Gaia. Apache grabs the rest of the team to rescue him, only to get shot down themselves. Now, I'm not going to say a lot of nice things about the animation in this series, because let's not kid ourselves, it's bad. I like the nice touch this first episode does by showing what the Maximals and Predacons looked like before they took on their beast modes. For all the shortcuts the show is going to do reusing old toys, this is good to see. Unfortunately for Apache and friends, they stumble upon the Predacon's ship and are hopelessly outmatched, needing Kimba the White Lion to rescue them. I joke, of course, as the second episode, Run White Lion, reveals this is actually Lyo Convoy. Turns out he survived his crash and was nursed back to health by a White Lion, who he got his beast mode from. Which sounds like how Tigertron was introduced now that I think about it. Now, as you can imagine, this was not a good introduction for the Maximal team since it made them look very incompetent and seems like it was setting the seeds for more of the leader worship we've seen in past shows. However, just this once, I feel like Lyo Convoy deserves it. Because Lyo Convoy is genuinely one of two competent members of his team. The second one we'll discuss later because he has some baggage. Now, unlike his teammates, Kid, Diver, and Bighorn, yeah, those really sound like Transformers names, Lyo Convoy seems to know what he's doing in terms of strategy and awareness of what the bad guys are up to when they find themselves in an obvious trap. 
It helps that he's not blatantly more powerful than most of the other characters. The plot doesn't bend in his favor the way it would for Fortress Maximus, and especially Jin Raisu. Like Optimus Primal from the original Beast Wars show, he's good, but he's not the Maximal's win condition. In fact, now that I'm thinking about it, that's not the only parallel Lyo Convoy has with Optimus Primal. He's a reluctant fighter that prefers peace, he's humble enough to be aware of his own flaws, and best of all, he absolutely hates it when the leadership worship does pop up, especially from Apache. <laughs> Yeah, Lyo Convoy and Apache's friendship feels like it's trying to emulate Optimus Prime and Ironhide, or to parallel Beast Wars, Optimus Primal and Rhinox, and it kinda succeeds, but unlike the latter two, I kept expecting Apache to burst into tears and scream out, Lyo Convoy Senpai, why don't you notice me? On the opposite side of things, we have the Predacons, and their goal to drain Gaia dry of an energy source found all over the planet, Angamolus. Unfortunately, how and why this Angamolus energy is more useful to the Predacons than the already established and frankly more fuel efficient Energon is not explained in this show. In fact, they don't explain it until Beast Wars Neo, which is still untranslated. Oh, right, I should probably mention, this show uses the Cybertrons and Destrons names that the previous Japanese Transformers shows used for the Autobots and Decepticons. I've grown to accept it by now, but it wasn't easy since when I first watched the show, I had to mentally remind myself that the villains are supposed to be Predacons, despite having vehicle-based alt modes, with the exception of their leader, Galvatron. Now, like before, this is not the original Galvatron, nor is he Beast Wars Megatron. Although, this guy does have a Dragon Beast mode, something Megatron would get later in Beast Wars. Anyway, Galvatron is one of the biggest mysteries of Beast Wars 2nd. For when the show started, the first thing he did is get himself knocked offline by an ancient Gaian computer, and then finds new ways to incapacitate himself over and over again for the first 15 episodes resulting in his younger brother Megastorm leading the Predacons for a good chunk of the series. This is certainly the most humiliating defeat of my entire career. Yes. Mind you, some of these instances are orchestrated by Megastorm personally, but it doesn't exactly make Galvatron look competent when he can't seem to stay conscious for longer than a few minutes. I mean, he literally gets drunk and goes on a bender at one point, which, of course, I'm sure reminds you all of this. <laughs> Stuff's the greatest! <laughs> ah, those were the good old days back on Cybertron! Didn't have to sneak around in these ugly ass disguises. <laughs> But once he's back on his feet permanently, there's a sudden shift between him and Megastorm's characters. The originally scheming yet cautious Megastorm becomes bold and incompetent. One episode even has him comically falling for his own traps. Seriously, the abuse Megastorm takes is on par with Waspinator, which I guess makes sense. This, this is the Beast Wars spinoff. Explains the similarities between Lyo Convoy and Tigertron's introduction. Meanwhile, Galvatron starts showing a thoughtful, more scheming side, like he's got all these plans in motion. What? <laughs> ah, but here's one character who remained consistent, Starscream. Now despite sharing the same name as the most notorious backstabber in fiction, he and his simple-brained partner BB remained loyal to Galvatron in the face of Megastorm fulfilling the more traditional Starscream role. Mind you, Starscream is trying to usurp Megastorm's role as Galvatron's second-in-command, so maybe his character is based less off of the original Starscream, and more Hellbats from Victory. Are you beginning to see the parallels between this show and others I've reviewed? I could not have planned this any better. <laughs> oh, of course. How could I possibly overlook Artemis and Moon? Two characters that fit in 
so well to the series. And by fits in well, I mean I have no idea what purpose they serve whatsoever. Okay, let's back up a second. These two are a pair of androids living inside Gaia's moon, watching the Maximals and Predacons fighting. And that's about it. They come onto proceedings in their squeaky voices and add nothing of value. And as if that wasn't enough, Moon eventually gets the ability to go down to the planet's surface, but can't be seen or heard by anyone. It is not until 36 episodes into this 43 episode long series for Artemis and Moon to interact with any of the other characters. I'm not even joking. But it gets even worse when Artemis starts crushing on Starscream, as well as this dickhead Scuba, one of the Maximals, the one who can transform into a squid. Because of course the little girl falls in love with a guy with tentacles. And as for your crush on Starscream, well... I don't think you're his type, kid. What? That's a stereotype! Downvote! Unsubscribe to the channel! Oh, but you got me all wrong. I don't think it's a stereotype. I think this character's just in love with himself. Kind of like Knockout. Hold that thought for a second, will ya? So I'm sure you're all asking the same question. Where's the plot? All you're talking about is a few of the characters. You haven't mentioned anything in terms of plot progression beyond the initial setup. I'm glad you noticed this. That's because there really isn't an ongoing story for a very long time. Most of Beast Wars Second's first half is a series of multi-episode arcs that spotlight a group of new characters. The Insectrons, the Autorollers, the Jointrons, and the Seacons. The last one is probably the best group of new characters because they have the most personality between a lot of them, and being space pirates will do that. It also gives Scuba a chance to shine, showing off he's the other member of the Maximal team that's actually competent. For the record, I was joking when I called him a dickhead earlier. I like this character. He's just, uh, has an unfortunate design. And it's also a shame that this storyline has a huge, huge, HUGE drawback. One of the Seacons, Skyla, I, I hope I'm saying that right, falls in love with Scuba, and Bighorn falls in love with her. <sighs> Sweet Vector Sigma. Now, going into this show, I anticipated Kid being the character who would annoy me the most, since he came across as a more annoying version of Cheetor. <laughs> Bumblebee, stop lubricating the man. Get that thing to stop, huh? Yeah, that's the quality of the humor in this show, the humor of the Bay Formers films. But in the end, Kid is much more tolerable than Bighorn. This guy is shouting obnoxiously all of his lines, always charging ahead because the color red sets him off, and of course, the worst part of all, his infatuation with this one of the Seacons. <laughs> Oh, fuck. I didn't even mention the worst part. Did I mention that he eventually gets help from the Jointrons? Oh, right. I didn't explain them. Well, let me put it to you like this. Skids and Mudflap are considered the most racist stereotypes in Transformers. People who say that have not seen Beast War Second. <laughs> you know what? Just build the fucking wall. It'll keep the joint trons out. And throw Bighorn over the wall with them while you're at it. Especially after I've had to put up with Bighorn spewing his verbal diarrhea in my ear. Wait a second. Bighorn transforms into a buffalo, and he's spewing his verbal, admittedly, diarrhea in my ear. What were they thinking? No, seriously, what were they thinking putting this in the same arc that introduces Half Shell, probably one of my favorite characters in this whole show, for much the same reason the leader of the dinos from Victory ended up resonating with me, his undying loyalty to his subordinates. 
And another one of the Seacons is an elder that all four respect. And they're space pirates. And they're a combiner team. And they grow a reluctant respect towards the Maximals over the course of this story arc. And they are trained to maintain a reputation as powerful warriors in addition to the whole space pirate motif. This is good stuff! You had the potential to make this the best arc of the show if you hadn't included this fucking love triangle. However, the end of the Seacons arc sees them flying back into space, only to have their ship get caught into the gravity of a massive structure making its way towards Gaia. Something under Galvatron's control. Which leads us to our first major plot shift in the episode Lyo Jr. Arrives. Lyo Convoy starts feeling pain in his Energon Matrix. Oh yeah, he has one of those there. Not the Matrix of Leadership, mind you. This is apparently something Commander Rank Maximals have now. I didn't mention it sooner because the show didn't. Back on topic, this heralds the arrival of a young Maximal dubbed Lyo Jr., Turns out, when Lyo Convoy originally crashed on Gaia, his Energon Matrix duplicated itself, for some reason, which then became Lyo Jr., effectively making Jr. his son. And Lyo Convoy turns him down. That's... Really not a good idea, especially since Junior's voice and behavior makes it very clear he's supposed to be a child. Considering it's also established he has Angumolus energy in his body, resulting in odd powers he doesn't fully understand, including, but not limited to, being able to see and hear Moon, it's about time someone did, this calls for guidance. Come on, Lyo Convoy, you're supposed to be the competent one. New Maximal, Skywarp, and Santin's solution, forcibly turning Junior into the third member of their Gasalt team, is throwing way too much at this Maximal CHILD all at once. Which I guess Galvatron is aware of, since in the appropriately named episode, Lyo Jr.'s Insurrection, he tries to sway the impressionable and confused Junior to his side. <laughs> So, in other words, peace through tyranny? As in, the quote on the original Megatron's tech specs? I'll discuss this more towards the end, but for now I'll say this is not a ruse to trick Junior into joining him. Galvatron genuinely believes what he's saying here. Backing up a bit, after the Seacon's capture, it was revealed the object heading towards Gaia is the artificial planet Nemesis summoned by Galvatron to drain all the Angamolus energy from Gaia. Wait a minute, his doomsday weapon is called the Nemesis? <laughs> I did mention this show exists because the second and third seasons of Beast Wars hadn't made it to Japan yet, right? Huh. And wait, is that Saturn the Nemesis is passing by? And is that Jupiter getting absorbed by it? The answer is yes. Yes, it is. For in the episode of The Fourth Planet's Emissary, the Maximals discover Gaia is Earth. <laughs> Well now, this is... Where do I start? I guess it's not exactly a plot hole. It actually fits with the overarching Beast era. Unintentionally. Kind of. It was established earlier that Gaia society existed 10,000 years ago. But if Gaia is Earth, that would mean it's 10,000 years into the Beast Wars future. But Beast Wars is merely 300 years after modern day. If this is taking place later, it still manages to fit. At least when you count Beast Wars' second standalone movie, which Optimus Primal makes an appearance in, and the Maximals treat him like a legendary figure from their past, which I guess he would be after how Beast Machines ended. 
Mind you, Beast Machines also ended with all Cybertronians becoming techno-organic, something that applies to exactly none of the characters in this show, but hey, the fact that it was this consistent with Beast Wars' larger canon is amazing enough as it is. Unfortunately, things become head-scratching once Kid opens his big mouth during a stressful situation. Shut up, Rat Trap! I mean, Kid. In all seriousness, what Kid just said there begs so many questions in regards to this show's continuity and connections to other ones. The thing you have to remember about Beast Wars is that its place as a sequel to the original Transformers cartoon works in America continuity, references to Primus notwithstanding. But as for Japanese viewers, it gets a little, um, impossible to exist in the same continuity. The reason? The Takara Trilogy. There's simply no getting around the fact Beast Wars established the Maximals and Predacons homeworld of Cybertron is intact and thriving, which directly contradicts Headmasters and the destruction of Cybertron. And Mars, there's another planet that got blown up in Headmasters yet is seen intact here in this show, which is supposed to be 10,000 years after that. Even if you want to say it's not canon to Beast Wars 2nd, then fine, but acknowledge this retcon in universe. Don't pretend it didn't happen, no matter how much we may want Headmasters gone from canon. Unless Beast Wars 2nd and Neo don't take place in the Japanese continuity, but neither show was really produced with the intent on bringing it overseas, so why would it be part of the American continuity and not the Japanese one? And oh, fuck. So, you may have noticed that I jumped around a lot during the second half of the series. After all, Lyo Jr. arrives is episode 26. The Fourth Planet's Emissary is episode 36. You're probably thinking, the show didn't go 10 whole episodes without any major changes, did it? Technically, no, since during this time the Predacons exposed themselves to Angamolus Energy to give themselves actual beast modes. Megatron and Starscream even renamed themselves Gigastorm and Hellscream. Wait, wait a minute. Hellscream is now a flying metal shark. What? We jumped the shark a long time ago. It was when Kid was pissing in a fire, wasn't he? That's what I thought. And for the record, no, Gigastorm isn't any more of a threat now than he was before, even though he's now borrowing Trypticon's toy for his new body. Let's see, what else happens? Well, Scuba gets a personal vehicle to ride around in. And I guess Saturn loses its rings, and the destruction of Jupiter is kind of important, but for the most part, yes. The plot is progressing this slowly. Let's see if I can condense the final arc for brevity. The Maximals catapult themselves towards the Nemesis, have a brief encounter with the Seacons, who are brainwashed into serving Galvatron, despite willingly joining him when we last saw them, but whatever. It gets undone, and the Seacons are... This sort of redeemed. It's one of the rare instances where a plot point is actually rushed instead of stretched out as long as possible. The Maximals borrow the Seacon's ship and fight their way through the Nemesis, but are too late to stop it from draining the Ingamolus energy from Gaia, converting it into evil Ingamolus energy. How do I say this without spoiling Beast Wars Neo? Hmm. Well, let's just say there's no such thing as good Angamolus energy. It comes from an evil source regardless and uh, whoa, whoa, what the fuck are you doing with that dark energy on? It's okay. I'm getting rid of it. I already put it in a bucket and I'm gonna get dispose of it as soon as possible. Well, get rid of it then. I don't want the literal blood of Unicron in my house. Trust me, you humans don't like dark energy on. We Cybertronians hate it even more. Ay. Dodged a bullet. Ugh, no kidding. Junior comes to Lyo Convoy's rescue when he and Scuba get swept away by the energy, resulting in... Yep. This is their big impressive combination. A green lion that barely moves because the animation is... Uh, not very good. I said Energon has the worst animation of any Transformers show, and in a way it's still true... But the animation here is, if nothing else, the worst of the 2D Transformers shows. Yes, even more so than the original series and Armada. Uh, I got a little sidetracked. Where was I? Oh, right, Gigastorm getting one-shotted by the Green Lion. Oh, 
I'll get back to that. Let's just wrap up the end of the series first. Once again, Scuba shows himself the f one of the few competent members of the team by revealing he drilled vents into the Nemesis so that when it explodes, it won't take Gaia with it. What happens next is kind of confusing. There's a lot of clashing of Angamolis energy from Galvatron and the two Leos, reminding me more and more of the endings of both Victory, Energon, and Cybertron all the same time. But suffice to say, Galvatron decides he won't accept defeat and sets the Nemesis to self-destruct which none of the Maximals are able to escape the blast of. Oh, uh, well, this is an odd way to end the series. Are they going to fake this out at the last second like they did with Victory? So, let's recap. The original six Maximals, plus Junior and his tutors, are stuck in another dimension. Gigastorm and the four core Predacons are floating aimlessly in space. The Insectrons, Auto Rollers, and Jointrons are stranded on Gaia. The Seacons are even worse off, where they're stuck on an asteroid. And Artemis and Moon are still on the moon. I guess. Happy ending! Beast Wars Second is a roller coaster of quality. On the one hand, there's some genuinely good characters and ideas that were good enough, but there's a lot to hinder the show. Its biggest flaw isn't the animation, or the weird music, or the odd plot choices. It's that Beast Wars Second is padded as hell. Not only is the story dragged out as long as possible, making it rather reminiscent of the Unicron trilogy, especially Energon, but that padding also consists of a lot of stock transformations, all of which makes it harder to sit through in this show, to be honest, especially with how poor the quality of the animation is. Seriously, the fights in Beast Wars Second might be the most boring fights in Transformers, with fights that consist mostly of monologuing, one opponent approaching the other, standing in one spot shooting, and if you're lucky, somebody might get flung back by an attack. Maybe. With the cherry on top is that there are multiple clip shows. You know the traditional clip show, right? A framing device followed by multiple clips from past episodes to recap what happened. The clip shows in Beast Wars Second play back entire scenes. Not abridged clips with voiceover entire scenes. A lot of the footage for this review actually is from the clip shows instead of their episode of origin. That's how severe it is. It's especially lazy when sometimes events will be recapped by the intrusive narrator because animating it would have been too complicated. Oh, and speaking of the narrator, we haven't had one this bad since Headmasters, constantly spewing the same plot points over and over again, which is bad enough when you consider we already have Artemis and Moon's running commentary, making the narration even more redundant. But it's still shoved in because I guess the people who made this show didn't trust the intelligence of the kids watching. Or did they? Since after starting the actual plot, Galvatron spins it in such a way that it's... Well, less black and white than when it originally started. The whole peace through tyranny thing was never really explored in the original series, so seeing it here in all places is odd. Now, Galvatron's still the villain at the end of the day, but when he gives a speech in the last episode about how you can't have peace without sacrificing your freedom and vice versa, Lyo Convoy can only respond with empty platitudes about justice. You get the sense even Lyo Convoy realizes he has no argument. Let's not even get into how Lyo Convoy and Junior's relationship is shockingly similar to the kind of life a military family lives. And on the subject of family, that's another matter that has more depth than I expected. Megastorm spends most of the series wanting to usurp Galvatron, but as the show continues, he reveals he's got a huge inferiority complex, wanting his brother's respect as much as he wants his job. And Galvatron seems to genuinely care about Megastorm in return. Oh, and just as a frame of comparison, this is how Beast Wars Megatron would treat his subordinates. Do not fire, Megatron! I have a hostage! Why, so you do! At this point, it feels like talking about the nuances of the main villain is becoming a tradition on this show. Speaking of tradition, there's a lot of things about Beast Wars Second's dialogue that make it... Uniquely Japanese. Let me explain. There's a lot of dialogue that includes wordplay and idioms that make total sense if you're of Japanese origin and speak the language fluently. 
Translate it into English and you will run into lines that come straight out of left field. This would pop up occasionally in the Takara trilogy, but it happens much more often here. To the point you have to remind yourself that these characters are supposed to be alien robots. From 10,000 years into the future. Oh, right. That. That's still a thing. I'm not as bothered by the characters shouting out TRANSFORM, or in the case of the Maximals... Because, as we already established with the Takara trilogy, these writers sometimes forget that they're not writing for Kamen Rider or Super Sentai. But as I was saying, it doesn't bother me like it did in the Takara trilogy, mostly because Beast Wars established activation codes were a thing. I would prefer it if they say maximize and terrorize, but hey, at least it's not out of place in the Beast era. In fact, there's a lot of things about this series that wouldn't feel too out of place in pretty much every Transformers series that exists. I know it's hard to imagine in a show that only exists to stall consumers until the remainder of Beast Wars was dubbed into Japanese, but it's true. Everything that's wrong with Transformers is here. Headmasters, repetitive dialogue, narrator, and sidelining of subgroups once the main plot starts. Master Force's empty platitudes about being a hero and justice and crap. The cheap animation of Victory, Robots in Disguise, and Armada. The poor pacing of both Armada and Energon. And the continuity problems of Cybertron. It even managed to throw in some literally piss-poor humor attempts from the Bayformers films. There's a butt in there. A big butt. Like your mom. Hey! Interrupting is rude! I was getting to that part. Now, despite everything I just said, there is still some good here. There's a lot of things here that are strangely reminiscent of both past and future shows. The complicated relationship between Galvatron and Megastorm reminds me a lot of the complicated relationship between Megatron and Starscream in Armada. The camaraderie of the Seacons reminded me of the dinos from Victory, not to mention Victory also ended with an exploding space station over Earth. There's the discussion of the peace through tyranny idea, which is given more focus in the IDW comics and the War for Cybertron novels. And then there's Megastorm serving as the main villain at the beginning of the series after successfully usurping Galvatron, only for Galvatron to return on a more permanent basis a quarter of the way through the series. Sounds like Transformers Prime to me. And of course, I can't forget Galvatron taking Angamola's energy into his body, giving him extra powers. Sounds like something else that happened in Prime. Hell, the Angamola's energy in and of itself... It, well, I can't actually say now because I don't know when, nor even if, I'll be talking about Beast Wars Neo in the future. But trust me, it's highly reminiscent of a more recent concept in Transformers lore. I really hate to end it on a cliffhanger like this, but I'm sorry, nobody's translated Neo yet. Which means we are now entering a new era of Werezilla's retrospective, as this was the last of the Japanese Transformers shows. I'm aware of something called Triple Combination Transformers Go, but it's only 10 episodes. It'll probably get a review in the future, but like Zone, it probably won't be an anniversary video. I mean, should I go back and review the original series? Or perhaps Beast Wars? Or any of the other American shows? I mean, should I review something else for anniversaries? I guess we'll find out. What should we do now? I think I know a place we can go to. If you guys don't mind taking a trip to Cybertron, of course. You'd love it. They serve dirty mech fluid with a touch of radium. Ooh, take the edge right off. Not only that, but uh, <laughs> the servant girls are walking around minus their torso plates. If you know what I mean. Sounds like a veritable nexus of culture and refinement. I'm in. Okay, you convinced me. Hey, horse version of me, you, uh, you want to get in on this? Wait, are you serious? Well, I mean, of course. You're part of the Wearzilla family. Just like my viewers. Okay, sure. Till next time, everypony. Now, I think the phrase you're looking for is... Till all are one. Why was I not chosen? Because, Inferno, when expecting booby traps... <laughs> Always send a boob in first. <laughs>